do another like this looks historic local art uh, show period. These are small, they're this size. They're even like in that angle, the size of the actual things are like this. And they're not frames, so they don't have to take up much room in the storage. Uh, I would also add that I, as um, in some of the like, background in art history, the kind of women's art, local women's art that is post war, is sort of this moment of like, oh, we have this time, this free time to pursue things, and some of them just look like they were actually becoming women. Um, the family owned a the sheep farm in the whole country, Longmont um, area, and you know, you probably will also get some things regarding that farm as well. So there's there's a decent connection to the Longmont. Yeah, they live out uh, at the west of the city of Longmont, but uh, the south of the <laughs> Uh, we received an offer of photographs and these type of what things we talked about relating to Antonio and Lange, also known as Yanga, <laughs> uh, Bachiore. Uh, they were opera singers that toured internationally in the 1920s. Uh, who retired here in Longmont, and they built 21, 25 Great Lane. Um, we, I, yeah, I thought these were interesting people that were really cool photos, and she's all kind of dressed up in opera gear. Um, and uh, they didn't really perform in Longmont, unfortunately, but they had this really interesting story of, of traveling all over the world, and some of these people were art in Italian. Um, also, the outfit that Bianca slash Blanche is wearing in them, really great examples of 1930s Italy. Can we do the outfits? I know, right? Some of the newspaper companies announced the, the stage sale, um, and uh, so the guide and all the stuff and stuff. <laughs> this was a very large donation. Um, so uh, these are all items that have come down through the descendants of the Hoffman Pennick Smith large families. Um, so there's a direct connection to the Coffin that were early uh, settlers here in Longmont. Um, most of the items are all more to the 1930s and 40s. Uh, so there's a whole packet of photos of the 75th anniversary parade. There is also a corresponding film, which has been digitized, he digitized on CD um, of that parade, which is pretty interesting to see all those basic pictures of his life. Um, there are some pictures of this of a large snowstorm, of flood, uh, events of Roosevelt Park, um, family members. Uh, there's a great photo of the Disney Road Board Camp um, and that was at the Great Western Hotel that we haven't seen before. Uh, there are also reels of the pet and doll parade. Um, there's one in the 1930s where the little, little kid is dressed up in all this. Yeah. What's this right? Uh, that's a striker. A sit down striker. Not. Genevieve Johnson. Of course, that helped me date the film. Of course, that was happening that, that year. Okay, to be dressed up as her. Um, there is also some really awesome scrapbooks. Um, Mildred Smith, uh, her father owned a, a monument, like a, like a gravestone company uh, out by Mountain View. Cemetery. Cemetery, no, cemetery. cemetery. And where um, Walgreens is now, where their monument uh, shop was. And there's pictures of that, um, which she attended to see you and kept everything that she collected. So there's um, a lot of things related to various social groups, uh, 
concerts at the Mackey Auditorium. Um, there was a bunch of color uh, games for the Um, so just lots of really cool, interesting things. Um, and then she also, I think this is from a little bit earlier, when she was um, or something, uh, in 1909, Scrabble, which it's like a composition book that she's kind of all of these like, things in the magazine. Um, like drawings, and little, little, little fashion drawings. Um, there's all these ideas about how to care for a baby. Um, and like what's in style, what's no longer in style. She can see all these little handwritten notes next to uh, what she's cut out. And then there is a photocopied diary from Ellen Coffin. She, uh, it's all handwritten and it's like basically, you don't know where the original is, they didn't know where the original was there. Um, but I heard that this is not something we already had. So it would be looking for someone to help transcribe that because it is all in the book. And also great so it'll be a challenge to read that. And last but not least, um, we had a woman come in with, I believe this was her grandmother, a little honor, uh, bathing suit. Um, there is, it's a big, heavy, gold, navy, black, um, kind of like a dress and pantaloons and then two sets of stockings, one white and one dark blue. They're very painful. Um, great example of what we need for bathing um, in the early 20th century. She does, she was born in Vermont, she moved here um, in her youth, uh, went to one of my Of course, we don't have a picture of her, but, uh, or at least in the outfit, but she did have a lot of As far as we know, we don't have a bathing suit with this. Questions? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to see some. I know. Well, I'll get the comments there afterward and I can pull out some of it. Yeah, everything. All of the stuff is here um, in, the, in my office. Archival material. I have a question about the film reels. They're actually multiple film reels. And he converted them um, on about in 2010. I did admit that he didn't use the highest quality, most expensive, yes. and also was in 2010. So he did. So there, in this is two CDs. Now, granted, he also said that uh, he basically took a whole box of these films. Well, he only gave us three. But initially in 2010, we had a whole box that someone could look at some of And he just brought it to the digitization place. And they just did it in order of which they pulled it out of the box. So it is a little bit like the clash of the video of Grey. And then clearly, like Easter footage of the family in front of their house. And then it will be like a road trip out east somewhere. And then like a parade again. And it will be maybe the same parade. So we have to kind of piece out exactly what is in that video. Um, and having the original film, if we wanted to be, do another digitization effort, having the original movie to go back to this case is great. Do you remember, is it eight millimeters? Yes. That's even bigger than the film, more a higher quality. Yeah, I think if we were ever want to use it, is it a uh, hard program? Professionally digitized by a commercial uh, place. It's that the problem. But for just reference, it's great to have a hard digitized. But it really is. So those be great. Luckily, these we checked, these are safety, safety yeah. which is uh, extremely long lasting. So, uh, if it was nitrate film, it was the precursor of safety film, that we have to get it digitized and then put it in the yeah, freezer for nitrate film uh, because it's actually a fire hazard to have uh, 
store. That's, yeah, that's, that's but safety film is, is it's actually polyester. Um, so that's one of the most eternal process. Administration. Um, I did note that the 2025 city budget was a challenging budget across the board and for, for, for the museum as well. We were not successful in getting uh, funding to support the operations aspect of the museum expansion. Uh, so you know, we will certainly be back in 2025 with hopefully our expansion will be 26. Uh, the uh, more compelling case. But in fact, you know, we're part of the general fund, the largest city fund, and there were no positions approved citywide in that fund. So I, you know, it's certainly disappointing, but it's also not a feeling of the city doesn't support the museum. It's just it was a very uh, so we're going to continue to look for other sources to support that and be applying for a grant. For uh, exhibits, and certainly so continuing to raise funds around the uh, exhibits, uh, you know, some other sources for uh, staffing, and hopefully, you know, city staff as well. Uh, let's go around exhibitions. Uh, so, one of the uh, really key areas in our expansion is our children's gallery. Uh, and our exhibits team is really hard at work now on developing prototypes for some of the interactives that will be in that gallery. Um, so they have built a number, and what we might do at a subsequent meeting is actually have you all uh, go up to the exhibits area, try a few of those out, and find different uh, interactives that they're trying, uh, and they're actually going to be doing some prototyping in uh, the discovery days. Uh, classroom next week with the two to five year olds just to see how they interact with some of these uh, hands on exhibits that we're working on. Do you want to share anything? Uh, if you haven't gotten to look at this exhibit in the flood, which is still today, because next week we'll be here. Uh, Allie and I are working on uh, photo shows. If you've been in this room prior to this exhibit, they're just like great. Um, photos from the historical sort of collection. Uh, we have identified a few panels from the Times Fall Collections, which should be a fun one. Um, we're looking at that now. And uh, I did a lot of historic walking tours last month, and today I did um, one for the city staff for Walk to the River, which is a kind of helpful initiative to get people outdoors and walking. Um, I'll be doing one next week, too. Uh, and uh, oh, I attended a conference of the American Association of the State of Public History. It was held in Mobile, Alabama. This is at the beginning of September. I uh, got to network with a lot of other public history organizations, um, state organizations. There was a showing of the 250th of the TS commissioners from all the different states, um, all of them being like, you know, the biggest um, showing. You know, we had a lot of things already together, it being extra special because it's also the 50th anniversary of the state. Uh, and we just got to learn more about what museums are doing and best practices and all of that. Uh, and uh, I'm currently also working on um, the very embryonic stages of planning the new history exhibit so for the expansion is complete. If you have any ideas or opinions on that, um, don't hesitate to, to let me know. No, there's no other 150, but everyone is gathering for this, and I 
So my point is, in order to fit the event of our tree of the Declaration, uh, is the big nationwide one, but yeah, a lot of the Western states are kind of, well, we'll figure it out later, but Colorado since we got the double end of our tree. Yeah, it's really us and like all of the East Jersey people. <laughs> so Rhode Island was there, New Jersey was there, Massachusetts. Um, so they have, they have so many museums after the Revolution was them to celebrate or to commemorate um, the manifestation of, you know, this is a way to celebrate um, in a way that maybe they did in 1976, but commemorate and acknowledge the good and not so great parts of history as well as. Uh, under education, uh, I don't know if any of you have gotten a chance to attend the Dia de Muertos celebration in downtown on Saturday, uh, but a uh, huge success. Uh, our town, around 5,000 people attended. Uh, so by far our biggest event we do each year, uh, and it's, it's headed up by uh, Ann Mackay and our education department. Um, and then, uh, if you're coming in, you saw the exhibition in the atrium, and then November 2nd, um, actual day of death, we will have Noche de Museo in the auditorium uh, with several performers, uh, so it's a great opportunity to uh, see that and close out the day of death celebrations. And also, you know, we hope to dawn a few months ago, yeah. but it's now painting the wall over there. Yeah. So, yeah, see a newly accession piece uh, installed and on view. It's, uh, oh, in, with a huge altar in front of it, built by the people who uh, created the original mural, plus mm -hmm. their family and friends. So, they were teenagers and friends. Photos. Uh, so, Art in Public Places, uh, along with education, headed up uh, a community paint by numbers project that was done in both Art Walk and Rhythm of Roosevelt. So, uh, see the photos, they did five different canvases using the same. Uh, design in different colorways, and then they were painted by the community at, at these events. Um, it, was, uh, it was a really fun community project. One of the things I really liked is a lot of times when we're out at these festivals, kids will come up and do whatever activity it is, but adults will be like, oh, well, that's what this to do that. But this one, kids would come up and do it, and adults would be like, oh, well, this is me. Art, I, I can do that. And of course, some people were like, oh, Art, I can't do that. I'm like, look, come on, it's me, my nonsense. <laughs> and uh, so people just really, uh, they got into it. Some kids got really into it. Like, I want to do this entire huge area. It was a really fun activity that I think we will probably reprise for some of our future festivals. Auditorium programming. We have uh, kicked off our fall programming. Uh, we'll have uh, tomorrow night is uh, in car program on Captain Spirit Rivers. Uh, it's a free program. Check it out. And then we started with uh, free concerts out in our car park. And also been uh, some little paid programs and some collaborations with the library as well. Development. I mentioned we're working on grants and also uh, our next big push on the expansion campaign will be our end of the year appeal. Colorado Gives Day is December 10th. All so we'll our year end campaign. the data on attendance. You see the, the difference, say, in August. Um, 
Lego grew three and a half times the audience that our uh, agriculture did. So that's one of the reasons we're so excited about having a dedicated children's gallery is um, we feel like that's a need in this community. And in fact, it came up in another meeting I had today. <laughs> and then I think the last thing I will just uh, mention under volunteer and evaluation coordination is the volunteer appreciation vest. That was that was all coordinated by a Fletcher or volunteer evaluation coordinator. So uh, thanks for all that you do on board. Uh, we don't say thank you enough, so thanks again. Appreciate uh, what you do with your role out. Uh, does Mike work with somebody else? Under the administration, number one point three, it talks about if you were hoping to submit the phase two of the museum expansion in a few days. So I just wondered, are we able to see that as an advisory board? Oh, and that was a, uh, I can uh, pull up the uh, uh, plans on that here. <laughs> so it might take a little while to get it down. Yeah, Basic, uh, well, sometimes it's just helpful when we're talking to people in the community to have a better idea of what's going on as far as the expansion. Mm -hmm. And I know it's changed a few times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're pretty, pretty dialed in at this point since it's been submitted once to the city. Yeah. Um, now it's it becomes very challenging to make big changes because then the sure. city planning is like, oh, this is different than we saw yeah. last time. Yeah. So, uh, um, what we are seeing now is at least what it will be, you know, we will send it out to bid um, probably early next year. And it's come back high, then we may have to do some rethinking, but at this point, uh, it's. And then when there's a development, what's What's our remainder, remaining goal? Uh, we've got about 900,000. I love it. Does that mean it's fine to support? We can still proceed with this. Yeah, we will. Uh, uh, our plan is certainly the. Uh, I think it's unlikely that the city would not fund kind of the really basic fundamental operations where our challenge is is funding for the additional staff that we would need to fully operate. So we we'll probably need um, we would do rather than changing exhibits more frequently, we would be changing you know uh, like we do now see here. <coughs> And uh, maybe having time to the gallery and start with the capacity for this additional staff. Uh, I'm still you know, very hopeful that we will get staff operating the building once it's open. Um, and, uh,
on my computer. Connected to the big screen. Do we have any um, unfinished business that we can address? Um, I don't know. I have a question. I have a question. I wonder if we're going to get some financial numbers this last month. You know, I don't know if that question is the question. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe this is the wrong time of year for that. Um, so what do you want to see, like the current uh, 2024 budget or the proposed 2025? Uh, that's still working its way through. So I was just current. Okay. Uh, so we're just so this was back a couple months ago. We had a um, decision to make on what the difference is between the year and for eight hundred dollars. <laughs> And I don't have a feel for what that, you know, how to say yes or no to that. Like, obviously, we have the space and store out the same thing, but the $800 a lot or a little? I, mean, I guess what I would like is an overview of our oh, yeah. situation and know how to make, how to, you know, some, some giving some assistance in making this. All right, well, one thing I can tell you is. Our total budget is about $2.7 million. Uh, so $800 is not a lot in that uh, overall uh, scheme. And I guess I would like to see what kind of prices are actually going to say. What kind of expenses? The budget we used to purchase the It's not the budget to your budget. Basically, funds from the sale of concession items over many, many years. So, we're going to look at every year after the year. That would be challenging. But I would like to have an overview of helping the sale. Helping to helping me decide how to vote. Some laptops are very happy next to the screen. Well, you can always you know, pack me for So yeah, I can I can definitely share our uh, our uh, budget, and I can share um, where we are as of October seventh. Last time I had the plan. and uh, the plans, yeah. It just helps as a board member, I think, to have some basic information so when you're talking to the public or friends or whoever, uh, you feel a little bit informed, more informed than they are. <laughs> 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 and it's a way to help promote the museum, too. Positive about what we're planning to do, you know, hopefully to find the things like that. And then we have under new business, uh, the American Alliance of the Survey Awards. Yeah, so we can do that. Does everyone have the paper version of? Out of that in front of you. So, this is an annual survey. Uh, we have participated now for the last four years. Uh, it's done, uh, so the first page is titled, and then they, they have. Uh, there should be a copy in that light. Oh, here. I, I have two comments. Oh, sweet. <laughs> uh, so on page two, it just kind of uh, describes the, the overall purpose of this survey is to understand who the audience is, uh, 
how our museum compares to other museums, and then there's kind of a broader look at society and, and how museums are responding to issues in the community and how the community and, and both general audience and museum going audience are comparing. Uh, Page three, uh, so 202 museums across the country participated, uh, the largest number to date. Um, and um, see that uh, we are generally considered a, uh, under this category, we're probably a history museum, uh, although they also have a category of general really what we had in the cross multiple disciplines. Uh, and one thing to note on this slide is that this survey is distributed primarily to uh, people who are pretty connected with the museum art. We send it out to our email list. Uh, so it's not necessarily interviewing people walking into the museum. It's not interviewing people walking into the museum for the first time because they're doing it nationwide, uh, they do it as an email survey. And, you, and you'll see that in some of the results, that they, they reflect more of the very frequent, very connected visitors rather than the more casual visitors, and then they address that. Um, so then the next uh, slide talks about, because they realize they are getting a sample that is very active museum goers. They also did a separate survey nationally of just U.S. adults and asked the same questions. And so there's some comparison to um, We had 227 uh, people respond to a good uh, sample size. Uh, and we go to the age of the response. Um, so they give four different uh, data groups. So the brown is all people who responded uh, to the survey sent out by museums. The blue is people specifically responding to Longmont. The green is that general museum category of museums that comes uh, part of the industry. And then the gray is um, the broader U.S. population sample. Uh, so one of the things that, that you see on this one is that we are similar to many other museums across the country in that the people responding to the survey tend to skew uh, older than the general population. Uh, you know, almost 40% of our respondents uh, were age 70 and over uh, compared with uh, about nine percent of the general uh, population. Uh, uh, next slide is about parental status. Uh, again, we see that um, we tend to what appears in the survey are uh, folks that may have had children, but they're not out of the home, uh, and uh, uh, the general population. Much higher than that. Next slide is, um, I think, one of the really interesting ones about the impact that COVID continues to have on museum visitation. Uh, so you'll see the 2020 survey, I think they, I don't know if they mentioned it in these slides, but they did that survey in like, February. So it is sort of the perfect snapshot pre-COVID because it was completed just before COVID. Um, and then we see, of course, the tremendous drop off in 2021, and then the build back up. But one of the things that's interesting, if you look at this, four times per year. So your frequent museum goers are still not back to where they were pre-COVID. And that's 
really the difference. Most everybody else, be two to three times a year, once a year, those folks, yeah, they're they're back even above where they were. But your really frequent visitors are still not like that. So museums particularly, uh, and I think we are seeing it not so much in our gallery visitation, but in our uh, our touring programs is where we tend to see you know, folks that come for many programs. There's not on the street. Next slide, talk a little bit about why they visit. <laughs> so again, this compares all museum goers, museum goers in Longmont, and then general museum goers. Uh, Longmont generally is, is similar in most categories. Uh, they're a little more likely to come to us because of interest in learning and curiosity, and a little less likely to come for wrestling. And that uh, is not surprising. Folks that, that come for respite to a museum are often coming either to a botanic gardens or a, an art museum or something where they you know, sit viewed with nature or art uh, versus uh, art museum. It's a little more active and uh, doesn't tend to be as much for us. Next slide uh, about what the museum does well. Uh, so a couple of areas here where we are significantly uh, different than other museums. People really like our programs. They really like our special events, again, compared to the broader museum sample and the general sample. Uh, and they also feel like we contribute very strongly to the quality of life. And I think that's a, a great uh, point to make if you're talking to folks in the community and they're saying, why does, why does the city have a museum? Why does support it? People see the Longmont Museum as contributing to the quality of life in our community. On the next slide, um, we see that people really, the major one is the third one over exhibits changing more. That's something that, that uh, you know, we've struggled with it because we have only the one gallery, and so it can only change uh, not many times a year. So, with our expansion, we have a lot more opportunities to change exists. On the next slide, repeat visitation rates. Uh, so, on this one, we started our survey the first year that COVID was really heavily uh, hitting us. So we've seen you know, very steady increases in uh, repeat visitation coming off of COVID. So the four times a year folks um, are now back above 40%. Uh, and uh, the people who visit you know, less than once a year went from you know, over half down now to uh, Five percent. So you know, we're seeing a very a sample, a very active part of our uh, audience in this. Uh, on the next slide, what inspires museum visits? Uh, there's interest in something new. Uh, that's probably that and seasonal events are the two that really stand out from uh, from the general museum. Responses. Um, and I'm bringing out of town guests who are below And then the next slide is about kind of a broader aspect of um, uh, society that um, the survey of museum goers has. Been exploring for a number of years, which is around attitudes toward inclusion. Um, so, looking at all museums, looking at U.S. adults, uh, we see 
that they grouped kind of folks into uh, several categories. About half of people are broadly inclusive, feel like um, museums should present inclusive content. Um, another group that uh, varies a little bit, but it's you know, around 20 to 25 percent, are generally, well, you know, we like the status quo, maybe they lean a little bit more or less for providing more inclusive content. And then there is um, a group of about 20% of the audience that is generally opposed to more of the uh, inclusive content that the museum tend to provide. So for example, our, our um, duality exhibit on uh, uh, indigenous art, you know, we'll see an example of that type of content we're trying to bring in. Long on tends to skew more inclusive than the uh, broader U.S. population or the population of uh, museum goers generally, uh, which I think gives us a little more flexibility to provide inclusive content. And um, as the, the folks who do these surveys point out, you know, you may get pushback, but realize it's coming from a small part of your overall audience. In our case, about 60% of our audience uh, has these you know, real feelings of we shouldn't be providing this inclusive content. We always, every year we do Day of the Dead, there are a few people that say, why is the museum doing Day of the Dead? Why don't you celebrate you know, uh, other cultures? And it's like, well, celebrate a lot of cultures, but um, Day of the Dead, we have got a lot of history. So that's not part of the reason why we're doing that. And so uh, it's just helpful to realize this is, uh, you know, they may be a loud voice sometimes, but they are a small percentage of uh, audience. And then the, the final slide uh, is just kind of uh, summarizing some of the uh, effects of COVID, as I mentioned before. Uh, for the most part, things have rebounded, but there is a group of you know, regular visitors that probably will come to the point. Uh, and then some final thoughts uh, you know, uh, around that inclusion uh, and generally the sense that uh, our audience does welcome more inclusive content uh, providing broad perspectives. Uh, and I also just wanted to mention well, the full slide deck is 125 pages. Uh, didn't want to go through all of it, but if anyone is interested, I'm just happy to share it. Um, there's, there's a lot more information in that about all the questions that were in the survey. Uh, 
So the part in gray is the existing museum. The part in white is the expansion. Um, and you can see that we are also then that sort of gray speckled area is the part of the site that will be affected by um, the expansion. So it will impact our front entrance, our current entry drive, and a part of the parking lot as well. So once construction starts, we'll lose about half of our parking for um, the period of construction. So we are working on to try and mitigate what's going to be expanding the dirt going on. So, like so, yeah, that, uh, that part that goes north off the page is in the dirt. So, what's the time for completion? So, we are hoping, and this again depends on uh, getting fundraising and, and getting through all the city approvals uh, that we will say once you start. Uh, we would start construction. Yeah, construction in uh, May. Five and their estimate is about 14 months starting time. So finish up uh, late summer. Is there a single story? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's what we are. Um, I might go through to a, uh, a ways down. For, oh, this one actually isn't too bad. It's a little bit chunked up. There. Architectural stuff. <laughs> so, expansion is basically right along here. So, this is the existing building, this one here. We will be adding on to our lobby a new front entrance here, a new set of bathrooms. Here and then a new main sort of circulation corridor connecting to the galleries. And we will have this new flex gallery space up here um, that, if we're able to um, build it as we hope, will be about 4,100 square feet, so 40% larger than our current one. Then this space here is currently our rising history exhibit. It will become the uh, new uh, children's gallery and then go down the corridor here to this space that will become our new permanent history gallery. And we will open with the uh, children's gallery and the flex gallery and then we will open the history gallery at some point. Later on, probably with sort of a long term temporary exhibit while we continue fundraising to do a full, uh, uh, more in depth and immersive things. Uh, and I know I asked this a long time ago is the shop getting any more space? If uh, so, there are two alternates that we are including in. The expansion. One of them would be a uh, expansion to the shop, and the other one is, and it's not really clearly called out, but it's basically adding on to the, uh, the flex gallery. Uh, this this drawing shows it with both of the alternates included, uh, and that's just going to depend on funding and um, what the bids come back to, to do now. But we would add about 800 square feet uh, of space on the shop and about uh, 900 square feet on the back. So, <laughs> yeah. And if I remember, we had the, this is going way back. <laughs> There was plans for expanding our pedagogy. That's definitely one of the Yeah, yeah, that uh, uh, both cost, and we did a, uh, an analysis with a consultant on uh, whether a cafe was really sustainable at our level of visitation and, 
And they basically said, well, you know, the cafe is probably not probably what you want to provide food service. What you could do is have kind of a drag and go type counter. So there's you know certainly an option to do that. And we you know, find there's a lot of demand because our gift shop will be larger. So we kind of uh, refrigerator with uh, some ready to We did actually stock some of those for a time in our gift shop. We really didn't find a lot of consumer demand for them, so our sense is we probably at least want to try that out. Uh, yeah, just, just the cost and uh, the foot traffic just. And how many square feet are we adding? Uh, we're adding about 6,000. 6,000. Yeah. Between the gallery, bathrooms, hallway, and uh, lobbies. Uh, we're also, I'll just note, we're doing a little bit of renovation backstage. Um, so you see the door uh, behind Sheila there. That door is not large enough to bring the piano through, <laughs> which means if we ever need to use the piano anywhere on the stage, we have to hire professionals to move it. And it's expensive, and then we have to get retuned and all of that. So um, we'll be enlarging that door and enlarging the uh, backstage area so it can be a little bit more of a green room for uh, performers and things. But right now, any more than just a couple of performers, we have to use this space, which means we can't use the auditorium and uh, as you see at the same time. So, uh, and tweaking the space a little more efficiently. Uh, given that it's 5.30, and I don't really have the budget in quite as neat uh, presentable form as this, I will I will send out a, uh, a budget so we can then offer it on next month's agenda so we can develop those answers. Do we have any other board comments? Um, is there a motion to adjourn? Is there a second? I'll second. Yeah. <laughs> we all second. <laughs> all in favor? Shockingly <laughs> unanimous. Um, we will call the meeting to an end at 5 31.